Good morning, church family. How you doing today? Wasn't it kind of nice to see the rain? I tell you, we have been needing it. It's a blessing to see God nourish our earth, but also to clean the air and help the fires. And we are blessed to be here this morning. And I thank you for each one of you who are here. For those of you who are on Fine. Thank you for showing up and for I pray that you'll have a blessed day, that you experience God as we go through our service. Uh, we're a new series today with Pastor Sergio. He'll enlighten with, enlighten with that more. I also want to make a point here on your bulletin inserts. We will be postponing our all church potluck, which is scheduled next week. sadness from wherever you've been come broken hearted rescue begin come find your mercy oh sinner come near earth has no sorrow that heaven can hear earth has no sorrow that heaven can Earth has 
has no sorrow that heaven can give. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can give. So lay down your burdens. Lay down your Happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath. It's good to be here, even though it's raining outside. It's kind of nice, though. It's good to be back. Got to spend some time uh, with some more students. Once again, I've been really, really surprised how... um, interactive they were, how responsive they were, really blew my mind as I got to uh, talk with them and, and, and meet with them, uh, over 300 plus students at uh, Georgia Cumberland Academy. I was really, really impressed. In fact, here's how I feel. I feel that if our church is in the hands of these youth, our church is going to be in great hands. We are, we are really, uh, I am still looking forward to what's going to be happening here in the next few years. Uh, and, and, and I got a surprise. I don't know how many of you, probably if I say the name, you may not totally get it. But, but the, a girl comes up to me and she says, hi, Pastor Sergio, how are you? And I'm like, okay, apparently I'm supposed to know this person. And uh, as I, so I, I did the old, you know, show me your face without the mask, you know, thinking that would help. So she pulls down her mask, and I'm like, okay, still don't know. And then, but I don't want to say anything, because, you know, it's embarrassing. And then she says, it's Chiara. And I said, Chiara, oh! And if you might remember, Chiara is uh, Naila's daughter. Naila used to sing up here. In fact, you remember Sophia? Uh, Sophia and Chiara used to be, like, together, like, glued together. They, they, it was so cool. But she is now tall and, and just grown up, and it's just unbelievable uh, to be able to see her. And she was, I had the privilege of having her introduce me on Sabbath morning to the class, and that was really kind of cool. I had a great time with them. Uh, and I, again, I just so, so impressed. But I will not lie to you, I am very tired. I'm trying to catch up. Whenever you go to the East Coast, Coming back, it's like, and then of course preaching uh, quite a few times a, a, a day, and then visiting the classes. Uh, it took a lot out of me. I'm I'm getting younger every day, of course. You know. um, anyway, uh, I wanted to share with you some thoughts this morning. I have some really treasured memories. 
uh, from growing up in Italy. Uh, and one of those treasured memories, uh, you, you know how when you're little, when you're young, there's certain things that kind of stick in your mind. And one of those things was the cart that would come with this horse and filled with produce. I mean, there was all, there was just, there was, it was kind of like a little fruit market on wheels. It was awesome. And uh, I don't know, maybe I liked the horse. I did always want a pony when I was a kid. Never got one. But anyway, uh, I just loved to go. My mom would always take me down, and they had these big, juicy grapes, luscious cherries, I remember, fresh, delicious figs, figs. It's hard to get figs here, by the way, like fresh figs. Fresh figs. Uh, ripe, sweet nectarines, strawberries, peaches, bananas, sweet melons, crispy apples. And then they had these, these blood oranges from Sicily. I mean, they were like red blood oranges. They were so good. And my mom had this thing about, about before she would buy it, she would say, you know, I want to taste it. And then she would have me taste it. You know, it was kind of cool. And so I got to taste the fruit, and she was like, well, let me try this one now, and then got to taste that one. Well, let me try this one now, and got to, got to have a meal before we got home. It was kind of cool the way my mom did that. We're going to start a new series called Fruitful. And I am excited about this series. I think there's some things about understanding the fruits of the spirits. That the fruit of the Spirit that is so powerful that I think if we miss it, uh, we will have missed a big thing. Now, again, it's one of those passages where you feel like, yeah, I know this passage. I've heard this passage. I've read this passage. Some of you may even know it by heart. And I'm going to, again, remind you, do not let the familiarity of the passage rob you of its blessings. There is some wonderful, wonderful morsels, some wonderful juicy parts in this fantastic passage about the fruit of the Spirit. And it starts off in Galatians chapter 5, beginning with verse 22. It goes like this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness. And then it says, against such things there is no law. Think about that. Against such things there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So we're going to be talking about some things here in the next few weeks of which there is no law against it. You can't argue this. You can't. There, there is nothing that can, that, that can make it worse or better. This is it. This is the Fruit of the Spirit. And by the way, there's an important aspect about this. This is not the fruits of the Spirit, although that's what we normally say, but it's actually singular. It is the fruit of the Spirit. It is one fruit that has nine characteristics in it. In fact, even when Jesus says, you shall know them by their fruit, we always say, we shall know them by their fruits. But no, it's singular. We shall know them by their fruit. And often we think that when Jesus says we shall know them by their fruit, what we're actually saying is we will know them by their behavior. We will know them by whether or not, depending on what they're wearing or or what they're eating or what they're... No. We will know them by their fruit. It has to do with these, the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to look at these in the next few weeks. But I want to give you a little bit of the context. What is the context? What is the background? What does... Why does Paul, and you know me with the why, why does he make this statement? What brings him to this point uh, in Galatians chapter 5? Why does he do this? And Paul is writing, believe it or not, to a divided church. I'm always amazed when I read the New Testament 
how much the church struggled with division. And I often used to say, well, that's because it was embryonic. It was new. It was starting off. And so they just had a lot to learn. But the truth is, and I think we would all agree, hasn't the church always been challenged with division all along? Even today, uh, probably I think one of the the greatest challenges to Christianity, it's something that Christ, I think, never meant, was to have 200 plus denominations, all claiming to be Christians. So Paul is writing to a divided church, a church being torn apart by false teachings, specifically in Galatia, uh, which is, by the way, present day Turkey. And in fact, in Galatians chapter 5, 4 and 5, we, we, we get this little hint on what is happening here. Uh, Paul says, you are trying to be justified by the law. You're trying to be justified by the law. That's why at the end he says, you know, these are the fruit of the Spirit against there is no such law, right? So you're trying to be justified by the law, have been alienated from Christ, you have fallen away from grace, he says. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. Through the Spirit, righteousness. Not by the law, but through the Spirit, righteousness. And I believe that they were sitting there hearing this or reading this and thinking, what do you mean through the Spirit righteousness? And then he explains it. The fruit of the Spirit are. After warning them of not being deceived by salvation by works, I'm not sure what is going on here. I feel like suddenly we're going to start dancing. I don't want, I'm a little concerned about that. <laughs> What's that? Disco church. Disco church, yes. Disco this way, disco that way. All right, so after, after warning them, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm, anyway, so not being deceived by salvation through works, after assuring, can you still see me? Good. Uh, after assuring them that their eternal... Now, we're really... This, this is fantastic. Can I just say something? I just have to say this. You know, we're kidding around, but these guys in the back work so hard. For, you know, I really... They're here early. Come on. I think it should be louder. I just think it's amazing how, how committed they are. Every Sabbath exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit, quite honestly. But anyway. So Paul, after assuring them that their eternal inheritance was not based on the law, was not based on works, was based on their adoptions as sons and daughters, it was not based on their performance, or whether or not they were circumcised, that was the big deal with the Galatians. After sharing with them the freedom in Christ from legalism, he decides, look, I better tell you this, and he is quick to point out that to live holy lives is to live through the produce or the production available from the Spirit. And we're hoping that in the next few weeks, the next few months, as we unfold each one of these fruit, that we will all be enriched and we will all be nourished by these fruits. And we will all understand what it really mean, means to live by the Spirit. To live by the Spirit and have the fruit of the Spirit. There's definitely nothing wrong with having the gifts of the Spirit. Those are important. That's what helps our church move forward. And we often talk about the gifts of the Spirit. And the gifts of the Spirit are great. They're important. It's what allows me to preach. It's what allows some of you to teach. It's what, allows, it's what allows these guys in the back to do what they're doing. But more than the gifts of the Spirit, what's more important, Paul says, is the fruit of the Spirit. You may not have realized this, 
But when you gave your life to Jesus, this is such a wonderful thought. All the fruit of the Spirit were planted inside you in seed form. And all it's waiting for is for that fruit to be cultivated. It's all there. You all have it. If you gave your life to Jesus, you have that fruit. It's just waiting for it. We can all be more loving, more joyful, kinder, more patient. All of us. Fruit will grow if we cultivate it. So we're going to spend the next few weeks and months talking about how do we cultivate these fruits, specifically, uniquely, because they're all different. Or at least the characteristics of the fruits are. So you have to prepare the soil, the heart, and you have to stay connected. In John chapter 5, uh, rather chapter 15, verse 5, it says, I am the vine. Who's speaking here? Jesus, I am the vine and you are the branches. And if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do just a little bit. Is that what it says? Apart from me, you can do nothing. And I'm always amazed how many of us are going around doing nothing thinking we're doing a lot. But apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. So what is our goal? Our goal is to be what? Connected. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, our goal is to remain in him, stay connected, and I in you, you will bear much what? Fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So if I want to bear fruit, I don't work on trying to bear fruit. What do I work on? Remaining connected. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Why is it that we struggle? I cannot tell you how many times I have conversations with adults, with church members who have been members for many, many years, and they're like, you know, how do I work on this? How do I become more God, how, what do I have to do to have more self-control? What do I have to do to have, and, and I'm like, listen, here's one thing you have to do, and it's the only thing that you can really do, and that is to remain connected to the vine. If you're working on trying to be something, you know, it's just like the old saying that I love, Morris Venden used to say, an apple tree produces an apple, not in order to be an apple, uh, an apple tree, I'm sorry, yes, not in order to be an apple tree, but it is because it is an apple tree. Does that make sense? If you are connected to the vine, if you are connected to Jesus, the natural result will be fruit. And so Paul is trying to destroy the, the idea of, of legalism. And he's saying, listen, you, you need to have Make sure that you're connected to the branch. You need to have plenty of sun, S-O-N. Lots of rain, Holy Spirit rain. Lots of nutrients, that's the word. And you need to protect it from the harsh aspects of nature, the frost, the winds, the thorns. In Jeremiah chapter 17, Jeremiah says, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. And see, all this language is all the same language. It's just taking from a different perspective, hoping that, that we all understand it from that perspective. But Jeremiah is saying the same thing Jesus said and the same thing Paul is saying. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who confides in him, who remains in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has 
no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. I don't know about you, but this has been a year of drought. This has been a year that we could have easily been afraid, but I love what it says. It does not fear when heat comes. If you are connected to Jesus, you don't have to worry. You don't have to be afraid. You just have to trust and remain in him. And it says, listen, it, it, it has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. To be able to have that kind of experience is something that I think all of us ought to be looking for. All of us ought to be asking God, please help me to remain in you. In Galatians it says, but the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against these things, there is no law. I heard a story once about a missionary candidate who was being examined to see if he could be a missionary. And one snowy morning at 5 a.m., the missionary candidate rang the bell of the examiner's home. He was ushered into the office at 5 a.m., and he sat there three hours past his appointment waiting for the interview. At 8 a.m., the retired missionary appeared, and he began to question, can you spell? Rather mystified, the candidate answered, well, yeah, of course I can spell. Good. Can, can you spell baker for me? Like, like a bread baker? Yeah. B-A-K-E-R? Are you asking me? No, no. I, I think that's how you spell it. Very good. How about math? Do you do math well? And now this missionary wannabe guy is really confused, and he's like, I know a little bit of math. Okay, let's really test that. What is 2 plus 2? Is this a trick question? No, no. Two plus two. Two plus two is four, I believe. That's fine, said the examiner. That's very good. In fact, I believe you've passed. I'll tell the board tomorrow. And the missionary candidate thought, man, they must be really, really in dire need for missionaries if that's the test. I mean, this is bad. But at the board meeting, the examiner reported on the interview, and he said, I believe that this young man has all the qualifications for a fine missionary. First, he says, I tested him on self-denial. I made him arrive at my home at 5 in the morning. He left his warm bed on a snowy morning without any complaint. Second, I tested him on promptness and faithfulness, and he arrived on time. Third, I examined him on patience. I made him wait for three hours to see me. Fourth, I tested him on gentleness and self-control by asking him questions that a seven-year-old child could answer. He showed no anger or aggravation. I believe he is the perfect candidate, and he will make a fine missionary. See, they were more concerned with his ability to produce the fruit of the Spirit than his ability to have the gifts of the Spirit. They're needed, they're important, but at the end of the day, what's more important is that we exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. I notice not only what the fruit is and what the characteristic of that fruit is, I notice what it's not. Have you noticed what it's not? And this is really important today. You would think it's not, but it is. 
Somebody should have told Jim Baker this. But one of the fruit of the Spirit is not wealth. Have you noticed that? It's not success. It's not fame. It's not even morals or externally driven behaviors. None of those things. That's not what the fruit of the Spirit are or is. It's kindness and joy. It just seems too easy, too simple. It just seems like this, there's got to be more to it. When somebody asks me, is your church growing? I will tell you, honestly, that in times like these, I am tempted to say, no, we're actually not growing. Our church is half empty. But that is not the truth. The church doesn't grow by numbers. What Paul is suggesting is that the true litmus test of a church growing is not how many show up, but are we more loving? When visitors come, are they attracted by our joyful attitude? Do we have less turmoil in our lives regardless of what is happening around us? Are we more patient with each other? Are we kinder? Are we more faithful with our resources and our talents? Do those closest to us notice that we are gentler, more authentic, Do we feel more in control of the direction of our lives, control over our temper, control over our appetite, control over our crippling habits, control over our pride? See, that is how a church grows. And what matters to me, I mean, sure, I would love to see the church filled. I'm not going to lie to you. But what matters more to me is that when I connect with you, I realize that you are more loving, more joyful, more patient, more generous, more in, moved towards service than you were last year. That to me means that the church is growing. And I think this whole numbers game is not a good game to play. Because at the end of the day, we've already lost that game. It's never been about numbers. The result of fruitful living is freedom from insecurity. It's not hatred. It's love. Not discord. But cooperation. Instead of jealousy, it's affirmation. And encouragement. Instead of chaos, it's tranquility. It's that peace that passes understanding. No matter what is happening. Instead of selfish ambition, it is a passion for kingdom advancement. I have to confess, uh, a little while this morning when I came here, uh, Bill was talking to me about some of the visions that he has for for, uh, some of the audiovisual things. And and I, I was paying attention as best as I could, but quite honestly, I was more amazed by his passion. And there were moments, I'm confessing to you, Bill, that I wasn't paying attention, not because I didn't want to, because I was just like praising God for the passion that he put in you to make this work. And I look at all you guys back there, and just to be there, unthanked, to do this work, all the Sabbath school teachers and all, you know, through this crazy time, being faithful. I love you for that. That to me is a growing church. That to me is what matters. Instead of being weakened by drunkenness, 
intoxicated by the joy of the Spirit. There's nothing like experiencing the joy of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Remember the story in Acts? And they were all starting to talk in, in, in different languages. The people thought they were what? They were drunk. But they weren't drunk. They were filled with the Holy Spirit joy. So we're hoping that in the next few weeks, as we go through each one of these, characteristics of this fruit of the Spirit that we all will be encouraged and we all will be impressed to stay connected and remain connected to the vine. That we may have these. I had two separate conversations last week with two very different young adults. I'll call the first one Matthew. He was raised a Christian, but is having some very serious doubts about God right now. He considers himself an agnostic. And he asked me some questions. If Christianity is for real, why do I meet Christians that are so self-centered? Why are Christians so divided? If Christianity is for real, why are, they such, why are there so many hypocrites in the church? Why are they so judgmental? Why are most of the Christians I meet so close-minded and unattentive about science and social issues? And please tell me, why are so many of them so sad and can I be honest with you? I struggled answering this kid. And I just try to tell him, listen, at the end of the day, what matters is not what they are like, but what you are like. You be who you want them to be. Start a revolution. You'd be surprised. The second one was on my way back on the airplane. I'm not going to lie to you. I was tired. I just wanted to read a book. I can't sleep on moving vehicles. I knew I wasn't going to sleep, but I just wanted to be by myself. I'm an introvert. You guys know that. I need to be by myself. I need to read. And there was a time where there was young lady by the window and there was nobody there in between us and there was mine. I was like, yes, thank you, Jesus. And then this very chirpy, wonderful young adult girl comes up. I think I'm sitting there. Okay. So I get up. She gets in. I'm like, please, God, let me just read. And she says, hi, I'm Emily. What's your name? Oh. Hi, Emily. I'm Sergio. Oh, that's fantastic. I, let me tell you, I'm from Montana, and next thing you know, we spend two and a half hours talking about her life. She's a Christian. She was hoping that she would sit next to a Christian so that she could talk. And I'm like, yeah, well, guess what? <laughs> I'm a Christian. I'm so excited to talk with you. <laughs> just let me just keep my eyes up. Yes, there we go. And we talked, and we talked. Quite frankly, she was delightful. And then she said, "You know, I prayed that I would speak, that I would sit next to a Christian." And the moment we started talking, she said, I knew you were one. Thank you, Jesus, that the Holy Spirit can cover a multitude of tiredness. <laughs> and then she said to me, would you pray for me? 
and there on the airplane, no matter who was listening, it, it, we couldn't care less. We bowed our heads and I prayed for her and her, her boyfriend and her new life and she wants to be a missionary and I, I just knew that God had made that moment. But what really surprised me was there was no doubt in my mind that she was a Christian and apparently there was no doubt in her mind that I was one. And I think it's because we both exhibited the fruit of the Spirit. When you do that, people notice. And you want to change this world? Then let the fruit of the Spirit come through you. And the way to do that is stay, re remain connected to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Well, I love these words we're going to sing here. Your will above all else, my purpose remains. The art of losing myself in bringing you praise. I love that because, see, Christianity is not about consuming. It's not, it's not about being consumers. It's about being consumed. That's why it's the fruit of the Spirit, right? Pouring ourselves into a malnourished world. Everlasting, your life will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all fame. My heart and my soul, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. and praise become my embrace consume me from the inside out Cries 
pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, we're excited about this new series, Lord, and, and just getting into the fruit of the Spirit, Lord. These nine characteristics that, that define what a believer should be, Lord, I just pray that as we journey through these, that your Spirit would be with us, that you would help us to understand, and that we somehow could become more and more united with you and, and, and and bear this fruit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a wonderful, wonderful Sabbath. See you guys uh, next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. And uh, we'll see you then. God bless you guys at home that are watching. <laughs>